Well, welcome back to yet, yet another installment of uh, Quadratic Forms, Automorphic Forms. I'm glad you all survived this far in the day, uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, today what I want to talk about, uh, or this installment, I'd like to talk about Clifford algebras, uh, which we've already seen uh, appear several times in Professor Paramala's talk. Uh, there they appear in terms of Galois cohomological invariance of quadratic forms. Uh, here I'd like to sort of like take a, a closer look at them uh, and try to use them to construct uh, spin groups, which are double covers of the orthogonal group and are very useful in the theory of quadratic forms. So uh, just some comments about this. Uh, we know from the Galois cohomology that uh, we have invariants from H0, H1, and H2. From H0 we have the dimension mod 2. From H1 we have the discriminant or the determinant. Uh, and from H2 we have the Clifford invariant, which is actually an algebra. So it's called the Clifford algebra. Uh, and so uh, you might ask if there are other higher invariants that are important. Uh, and if you're working over a number field, which is the, the place that I usually work, uh, the answer is no. Uh, because if you work locally, then uh, the local fields have cohomological dimension 2. And so all of the HIs for, for I bigger than or equal to 3 vanish. And so the classical invariants are really the only invariants. And you can use them to distinguish quadratic forms of isomorphism. And so it's really nice to be able to, to look at those and, and try to see as much uh, information as you can extract from them. Okay. So that's the idea of today's lecture. So let's start with uh, symmetries. So what I'd like to do is to try to understand the orthogonal group, uh, or in this case, the special orthogonal group. Uh, so I'd like to try to understand uh, the orthogonal group, or the special orthogonal group, uh, geometrically. Uh, and this approach, uh, when I say geometrically, I mean in terms of the vectors in the underlying vector space of the orthogonal group. Okay, so here V is taken to be some quadratic space, some vector space over a field K. So K is equal to, again, a field. Uh, and the characteristic is always not equal to 2. Uh, and you can define symmetries. So given some vector V in V, uh, where the length of this vector is not equal to 0, we can define uh, a symmetry, tau sub v, uh, which is a map that uh, it gives you a reflection. What I like this to do is I like to, uh, the picture, I guess, that has some vector space, and there's some vector v here of non-zero length. Okay. So in general, it's a positive definite uh, space. You don't really have to worry about this because every vector is non-zero length. But uh, if you try to write this down, you'll see it's really important the length is not zero. Uh, and then uh, I have a perpendicular subspace to this. Okay, so that's V. There's maybe some orthogonal space, so I'll call that V perp. Okay, that's the orthogonal space. What I'd like to do is I'd like to preserve V perp, okay, and I'd like to reflect V across it. Okay, this is an orthogonal decomposition. I can always do that in the field. And so what I would like tau of V to do is to just do this reflection. Okay. So if you write down what this is in terms of linear algebra, this should be X. Uh, so we all know how to, uh, to talk about the projection of V on of a vector, X, if you choose some X. You can project x onto v, okay? and this projection is described in terms of some inner product. Right? It's the inner product of uh, x with v divided by the inner product of v with v okay? in the v direction. So in this case, uh, the inner product is given by the Gram matrix, uh, which is uh, b of xv okay? divided by uh, the inner product of v with itself, which is just q of v okay? in the v direction. Now this is the this piece here is the projection. This piece here is the projection of x onto v. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to flip x across this plane. And so I'd like to subtract the projection and then one more of it. So I want to do that. Yes, this is the definition of a symmetry. Uh, and because this is an orthogonal basis, you can see that the symmetry is in the orthogonal group of v. And so this is one way that you can start to geometrically understand the orthogonal group, is you can look at all these symmetries. You can see, well, how do they sit inside of the orthogonal group? So that's the idea. Uh, so let me just uh, state a lemma. I guess maybe I'll, I'll just make a note. If you want to be inside of the special orthogonal group, O plus of V, uh, then this symmetry, you can see that it always has a determinant minus one because it, it preserves the space and it's reflecting a vector. And so if I take minus tau V, then this is in the special orthogonal group. Okay. So you can see here why the condition that V is non-zero be important, because here I'm dividing by it, and so it doesn't make sense unless I do that. 
I'm sorry? The dimension is odd. I'm sorry. Oh, let me, so this, the, the problem is with this comment, right? Okay. So if the dimension of V is odd, then the comment is that this is. Minus the transformation. Oh, uh, this is in. Oh, okay. I guess I really want to say this is in O minus. That's what I'm going to say. And the determinant of this transformation is minus one. This is. Oh, this is. Okay. All right. Determinant of tau of v is minus one. Determinant of tau v, right? That's what I want to say. Okay. So that's all I want to say. Right. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. okay. Sorry. Okay. So. Uh, so the lemma that I wanted to just state is that uh, to see how reflections act on vectors, it's kind of useful if you want to, to see how much of the orthogonal group you can get, uh, you can try to uh, act uh, on a reflection and take one vector to another. Okay. So, uh, so if I have some vector v and w uh, in the vector space, uh, and q of v is equal to q of w, then you can try to find a, a reflection that takes v to w. Okay, because these have the same length, so it's an orthogonal element. And so uh, the lemma is that the transformation u minus uh, v minus w, so I'm going to try again, tau v minus w should take v to w if this thing makes sense, if q of v minus w is non-zero. Okay, this is just something that one can check. But it's really useful because what it lets you do is it lets you use uh, these reflections uh, to move around uh, explicitly in the vector space and to do things in your orthogonal group. Okay. So that's what I wanted to say. So using this, uh, you can prove a theorem, which is really cool. And what it says is that if you look at all of these transpositions, O plus of, or O of V is generated by symmetries. So if you look at all the symmetries together, you get the entire orthogonal group. Okay. So the proof of this uh, basically just says if you choose uh, an orthogonal basis okay, for your space, uh, then I'll look at some sigma in the orthogonal group. Okay. Uh, and sigma is going to take your first basis vector uh, to some vector w1. Okay. So I know that uh, because these have to have the same length. Okay, q of v1 is equal to q of w1. And so uh, the question is, can you try to get from one to the other by symmetry? Okay. If you can, uh, then so if q of v1 minus w1 is not equal to 0, we have a symmetry uh, carrying tau sub v1 minus w1, which takes v1 to w1. Okay. And you can uh, divide or multiply by the inverse of this transformation. And what you'll do is you'll have uh, some sigma minus uh, sigma times the inverse of the symmetry, which is just itself. So the inverse of a symmetry is the symmetry uh, that will then preserve v1, okay? and that will then uh, have some uh, isometry on the orthogonal complement. Okay? On the orthogonal complement, then that's a smaller dimensional space, and you can repeat the procedure. Okay? So then sigma times tau v1 minus w1 uh, fixes v1 and acts on v1 prop. And then you can repeat. However, this is only true if this vector has length 0. But 
Uh, is thank you. I need to sleep a little bit more. Thank you. So keep me honest. That's very good. So if this vector has length zero, then we're in trouble. Uh, but we can try to use something else instead. We can try to use try to use the transformation of v1 plus w1. And if you do this, this should carry uh, v1 to minus w1. And then you can try to you can just do an extra flip across w1. Okay. Uh, and the thing to notice is that both can't have length zero. And the proof of that, so the proof of the thing in the proof, is that if you look at q of v1 plus w1 uh, and q of v1 minus w1, okay, then by the polarization identity, okay, so are we going to use this uh, polarization identity, which we saw in Professor Conway's talk uh, in his definition of a, bilinear, of a quadratic form, that q of x plus y is equal to q of x plus q of y, plus 2 times the gram bilinear form of xy. You can see that this is equal to just 2 of qv1 plus 2 of qv2, uh, sorry, qw1. And since these have the same length, this is just 4 times q of v1, and this can't be 0. So you can't have both of these equal to 0. So one of these two operations works, and so you can always uh, generate uh, the orthogonal group by symmetries. In fact, you can generate it by uh, two n symmetries okay, from this proof. Because if you fail at every step, then you have to do an extra symmetry to reflect uh, w1 to minus w1 at every step. Okay? And that reduces your dimension by 1. So that's proof. So what this lets you do is it lets you understand the orthogonal group in terms of symmetries. You say, well, why is that useful? And the reason it's useful is because uh, you can define uh, additional maps on the orthogonal group by using these symmetries. So I'm going to give a relatively unmotivated definition I'll come back to later in the language of Clifford algebras. So we define the spinner norm map. So I'll call this Sn, from the special orthogonal group to the square classes, k cross mod k cross squared, by taking any element here. Uh, and we know that any element in the orthogonal group, or in the special orthogonal group, can be written as a product of symmetries. So I'll just write it out. So this is tau y1 through tau y r. And what we'll do is we'll just map that for each of these vectors now, these vectors y1 through yr, uh, they have a length. And I'll do the very strange thing of taking this to the product of all of the lengths. We know these lengths are non-zero, because that's the way it's defined. And so this gives us an element of k cross. But uh, it's only well defined up to uh, scaling, because if I take the vector y1 and I replace it by 2y1, okay, that changes within a square class but it doesn't change the, uh, the element of the orthogonal group you get by the reflection. Okay, so they induce the same symmetry, so uh, this is really only well-defined up to square classes. Okay. And the claim, which we'll come back to, is that the spinner norm map is well-defined. Okay. So the spinner norm map plays a, a really useful role in quadratic forms, in particular uh, for quadratic forms that are indefinite in odd numbers, of, uh, or they're indefinite in three or more variables. Uh, we'll see that in a minute. But so now let me just digress. I just wanted to give some feeling for the geometry of the orthogonal group and some map you can define on it. Uh, I talk about the Clifford algebra. Okay. So uh, the Clifford algebra, by definition, so given some quadratic form uh, over a field k, to find the Clifford algebra c sub k of v to be equal to a quotient of the tensor algebra. So this is a we'll 
which Professor Paramala wrote down as T of V, which is the direct sum uh, where I goes from zero to infinity of the tensor product of the ith tensor power of V. Okay. Up to the relation that if I have any, uh, to el any element of V and I square it, so meaning V tensor V here, uh, is equal to Q of V. So this is a relation that it cuts across the grading here in the tensor algebra, uh, but it's a, it, it always preserves the parity of the grading. Okay. So this is the definition. Uh, in general, if you want to write one of these down, it's, it's fairly easy to do. Uh, you can just take a basis for the, uh, for the vector space V, and you can try to express everything in terms of this basis. Okay. So for people who are not so used to the Clifford algebra, which is a very reasonable thing, let me just make some comments. So, what I'd like to say is that uh, if I take the quadratic form to be identically zero, the, the zero quadratic form, okay, then uh, the relation here is that v squared is equal to zero, which means that this is uh, a quotient of the tensor algebra by the symmetric algebra, that's the exterior algebra. Okay. CK of v is equal to the exterior algebra. Of v. Okay. So uh, if you want to think about the Clifford algebra in a family, okay, or just over uh, uh, some place where your quadratic form is degenerate, uh, you can think of it as sort of a, a generalization of the exterior algebra, uh, and it, it sort of behaves like that. Okay. But there's a lot more arithmetic built into the Clifford algebra, because the Clifford algebra, it encodes the arithmetic of this quadratic form. So if you're over a field, it, it encodes that. And you can also talk about these defined over a ring, which I don't have a lot of time to get to, because I promised I wouldn't run over. But uh, we'll see. Okay. So uh, some facts about the uh, Clifford algebra is that so the relations that we have in the Clifford algebra, just to work with these, uh, we certainly know that if you have any vector, we know that v times v is equal to q of v. Okay. And q of v is some scalar. This is in the base. Okay. So anytime you square, you end up back in the so the first graded component, uh, at least defined with respect to a basis. Okay. And you also have another relation, uh, which you can see if you take v plus w, and you square it. Okay. This is equal to v squared plus vw plus wv plus w squared. Okay. Uh, and we know that this is, just by definition, this is q of v plus w, okay. because of this relation here. And we know that this is Q of V, and we know that this is Q of W. And so by the polarization identity, we see that this must be equal to 2 times the gram bilinear form of V and W. So this is our second relation, is that if you try to do things in a commutative way here, this is not, this is not commutative if there's some bilinear form, bilinear pairing between your two things. So VW is equal to minus WV plus 2 times the bilinear form of V and W. So that's the second relation. So these are the main relations that you use when you work with the Clifford algebra explicitly. And so uh, if we take a basis, Uh, v1 through vn, an ordered basis of v, we can express every element uh, of the Clifford algebra, c of v, in terms uh, of a linear combination, or I say as, as a linear combination. Uh, of uh, products which look like v i1 through v i r, where i1 is less than is less than i r. These are the indices of the basis vectors here, okay. uh, and i sub j is in the set one through n, and v sub i is in our basis b. Okay. Oh, sorry. So this is just by applying this uh, repeatedly uh, and using linearity. Okay. 
Okay. So what we're doing here is we're always we're always ordering the basis elements in a sort of increasing way. So uh, as a corollary of this, you can see that the dimension of the Clifford algebra, so the dimension over k of c of v, is equal to two to the n, because that's just the uh, the number of possible choices of basis vectors. Also, you can see our relations preserve uh, the grading uh, up to uh, parity. So all of the relations where we would change uh, an element by, uh, we, we would use one of our relations, they're always changing, uh, the quadratic relation is changing us, uh, changing the parity of the element. Uh, it's changing the uh, element, but only up to something of, uh, up to something of the same parity. Okay. So what this means uh, is that you can look at the subalgebra, so the of the Clifford algebra with uh, even parity is called uh, the even Clifford algebra. Uh, and if you want to sort of explicitly write this down, then you can write down in terms of a basis this uh, this graded thing, and then just look at the even graded pieces. And they should be uh, they should be closed under addition and multiplication. Okay. So uh, what you can do is you can uh, you can write down either the Clifford algebra or the even Clifford algebra, depending on what you're interested in. And Professor Paramala mentioned the following theorem, which is that uh, the Clifford algebra. Uh, is a central simple algebra, which is a very nice class of algebras. Uh, if n is even, uh, and the even Clifford algebra, I should call this even Clifford algebra C plus of V, is a central simple algebra if n is odd. And the issue is just what the center of this is, uh, and you can work out what the center is explicitly in terms of a basis. There's uh, this element that is the product of all of the basis vectors, uh, and that's in the center, and you'd like to just sort of decide whether or not that's in your, uh, your even or odd piece. Okay, okay so that's, uh, those are some basic facts about Clifford algebras. But there's something else I want to say. Right. Uh, there's a couple more features that the Clifford algebra has. So other features. One is that uh, there is an involution, C of V and C plus of V, have an involution uh, which takes any vector, uh, which can be written as well, any uh, V1 through Vn, and it sends it to, so let's call this V, to V prime, which is you multiply them in the opposite order, Vn through V1. It's called the main involution of the Clifford algebra. And you can use this to define a norm. Norm of V, which is just V times V prime. Now, in your Clifford algebra, it may not happen that everything is invertible, but if something is invertible, uh, it's invertible on one side, it's invertible on the, the inverse is a two-sided inverse, and you can explicitly write it down uh, in terms of this. So if u is invertible, i.e., the, uh, there exists some u inverse in C of v, such that u times u inverse is equal to 1, then you can explicitly write down what this inverse is. u inverse is just u prime over q of u. You can check that this is inverse because you multiply this times this. It gives you uh, that element. Uh, and if, this, if, if there is an inverse, then 
you can always scale uh, scale this by Q of them. Oh, norm of you, thank you. Okay, so uh, that's basically what I wanted to say about the Clifford algebra in general, in broad terms. Uh, and I'd like to try to use the Clifford algebra then to understand the spinner norm map uh, and to construct a cover of the orthogonal group. Okay, so so uh, inside of the Clifford algebra, so inside of C plus sub B, so in the even Clifford algebra. Consider all elements so that uh, u is invertible uh, and u, uh, well u certainly acts on the Clifford algebra by conjugation uh, if it's invertible and so I can look at how this conjugates on the vector space v sitting inside of the Clifford algebra. Because V sits inside uh, in the first graded piece, okay, in terms of the basis anyway. The grading is not uh, well defined, but, but given a choice of the basis, then you do have a, a grading. Okay. So you'd like this conjugation to stabilize V. And so uh, we'll define this to be the set M plus of V. So the idea is that we'd like to sort of work out what conjugation does uh, on the Clifford algebra to the vector space. So uh, if you do this, then it's kind of interesting to note that if uh, that this actually gives an isometry. Okay, so I guess I should say a conjugation uh, gives by m plus of v gives an isometry on v. So I just want to work out why that's true now. So to show that it gives an isometry, I like to show that it preserves lengths of vectors. So this preserves all the lengths, it also preserves the inner products. And so uh, what you need to compute is you just need to compute q of u x u inverse. So Q of ux u inverse now in the Clifford algebra can be written as a squaring operation. So this is ux u inverse times ux u inverse. And we know that this is the inverse, so this is just one, goes away. So this is ux times x times u inverse. So you really get to see the Clifford algebra working for you here. Now we know that x times x, this is this is equal to Q of X. And we know that uh, X is a vector, so Q of X is a number. And so this is, this is in K. So if this is in K, then uh, this is going to commute uh, with a multiplication by U, because it's a scalar. And so what you can do is you can just rewrite this by pulling the scalar out. This is X times X times U times U inverse. So this is in the center. times u times u inverse, uh, but then I, u and u inverse again cancel. This is just x squared, which is q of x. So that's nice, because you can see that conjugation explicitly gives an isometry, and you can try to understand uh, what isometries you get through this conjugation. This is sort of the key computation. Okay. So, Another thing to notice uh, is if I happen to conjugate by a vector, so uh, I have uh, inside of, let me just be a little, a little careful here, so inside of the Clifford algebra, uh, I'm looking at the things which uh, conjugate v to itself. Uh, and so here I've conjugated by any element, uh, which is invertible, okay, and happens to act on v. Uh, but you can also conjugate by particular elements, so I'm going to conjugate by an element of the vector space v itself, which is in the Clifford algebra, and see what we get. Okay, so a special case of this is that if I have some vector uh, u, which is in the vector space, 
then uh, the conjugation, then uh, if u is in, I guess I should say, if u is in m plus of v, then it certainly has to be in, uh, have length non-zero. Okay? For it to be invertible, then uh, I know that x times x is the length of v, and if that's zero, then that means x squared is zero, so there's no way to invert it. Okay. So this means that q of u is not equal to zero, which is a familiar thing. Right? So this is a, not an isotropic vector. So x times u times x inverse, so do we do this? So I guess the question is how does u x u inverse act? So the proof of this is a little bit easier if I work out in terms of, well, I guess it doesn't really matter. So if I take ux, u inverse, I know that u inverse can be written in terms of uh, u prime okay, divided by u prime, right? So this is ux times u prime over the norm of u. But since the length uh, is zero here, I, this is just the same thing as u over but the length is non-zero. This is the same thing as u uh, u x u over q of u. I'm sorry. But u squared is q of x. So if I take u times u over q of u, then that's also equal to one. Okay. Yes. This should be an and. So I happen, if it happens, I take some vector of in, in V, and it's in this invertible set, so it acts properly on the vector space by conjugation, then it has to have non-zero length. Thank you. So now, I just want to work out how this works. So this is equal to 1 over Q of U times Ux U inverse. So Ux U inverse can also be written as, I'm sorry? Ux U. U X U. So this is uh, U X. So U X U is the same thing as U X. I'm going to try to make this into a bilinear form here. So this is U X plus X U times U minus X times U squared. Let me just make sure I have this correctly. So this is U X U here, uh, and I'm symmetrizing this, and I'm subtracting off the symmetrized uh, the difference. Okay. So the reason I'm doing this is because this piece here. This is 2 times b of ux. Okay. From our relation before from the polarization identity. And this is equal to q of u. So when you work out what this is, this is uh, 2 b of ux times u over q of u minus <coughs> q of u x. Uh, is that right? Over q of u. Okay. So the q is cancel here, and so this takes the vector x. So x goes to ux u inverse, which is the same thing as minus the symmetry tau u of x. So the idea here, the thing to notice about this computation is that if I conjugate by some vector in u, uh, which has non-zero length, then it gives me uh, something like a symmetry. So this is nice because this is related to sort of the spinner norm. It feels like uh, I'm doing something here with the spinner norm, but I'm also doing something that's multiplicative. Okay? So remember the spinner norm was something where I took the product of all of the vectors, the lengths of all of the vectors u, uh, and here, what I'm doing is I'm conjugating. So if it happens that I can write some element uh, of the orthogonal group in terms of these conjugation operations, okay, then this is just uh, taking the norm of the element u that I'm conjugating by. 
Okay. So, so this gives a well-defined map. Gives a map from uh, M0 of V to the orthogonal group of V okay. by conjugation. So here I'm going to take uh, any element of right, any element u here, I'm going to send it to u x u inverse. It's a conjugation operation. Okay. And uh, you can actually show, so it's a little bit harder to show, this is a map into the special orthogonal group. So I'm not going to show that, uh, but you can see that this map is is going to be surjective onto the uh, well. Can you see? Right. So because you can write any element of the orthogonal group here, uh, the special orthogonal group as a product of symmetries, then you can just take that product of symmetries here, and you can see that the map is easily surjective. Okay. So that's what the the previous lemma says, uh, and you can compute the kernel of this map. M plus. Thank you. So with kernel, k cross. Because if I conjugate by a scalar, I'm not going to do anything. Okay. So, uh, see how much time? Do I have 10 minutes left? Okay. Great. So this gives a commutative diagram. So let me just put up. Okay, hang on a second. We're experiencing technical difficulties. Hello? Okay. Great. So the point of me saying this, I'd like to give a feeling of the interpretation of the spinner norm uh, in terms of this Clifford algebra. I'd like to also show that the Clifford algebra is really useful for understanding the orthogonal group. So I'm just going to put this together in a map here. So I have a conjugation map, uh, which maps this m plus of v onto the orthogonal group. Okay? And I have a spinner norm map, which takes us to k cross mod k cross squared. Okay. So uh, this conjugation, if, if you want it to be... Uh, Right, on m plus of v, this is the norm. Uh, and you can uh, work out the kernel of this map. So the kernel of this map uh, I'll call theta. And this is defined to be the kernel of the spinner norm map. So this is a really important group. Uh, and the reason that this is important is because I can look inside of m plus of v. So m plus of v are the things uh, which are invertible, which act prop, which act uh, nicely on v. They preserve v, and you can look at things inside of there uh, which of norm one. Okay, so I'm going to look at the kernel of the norm map now, and this is called the spin group. Okay. So let me just write down here: spin of v is equal to the set of all u in M plus of v, such that u u prime is equal to one. Okay. Now, this acts here by conjugation, okay, just through this map, because okay, you can still conjugate. Uh, and its image here is exactly the kernel of the spinner norm map. Okay, so it's not hard to check uh, that this is the spinner norm map here. Is, is, well, since it agrees with the norm here, the kernel is this, uh, is this thing. It's the kernel of the spinner norm map. And so if you're looking at the orthogonal group, okay, and you'd like to understand how the spin group is acting, okay, the spin group acts through this object here, this theta. And so if you'd like to use the spin group for equivalence, which is, uh, what's really, uh, which is really useful uh, in understanding quadratic forms in genera, then uh, this kernel of the spinner norm map uh, exists here. But this is, this is really the spin group. Okay? So that's how you should think about this kernel of the spinner norm map if you're reading about this. Okay. Great. So uh, let me just make a quick comment about this while it's, while it's here. So the, uh, 
The spin group is a double cover of the special orthogonal group. Okay, so if you look at this over the real numbers, uh, uh, then or the complex numbers, you can really see that this is this is a double cover. Okay. Uh, well, let me see over the complex numbers. But uh, it's a strange thing because when I look at the map from the double cover to the group, it's not surjective. The map of the double cover to the group, it's it sits inside of this subgroup, which is the spinner norm kernel. How can that possibly be? The reason is that there are square classes that are an obstruction to being able to understand uh, the spin group, uh, the spin group as realizing this map. So uh, if there were no square classes, this really would be surjective, uh, because this would just this kernel would be everything, and this would be this kernel would be everything because you'd just be mapping to one. Okay. So uh, the idea is that if you take some element and I have u x u inverse uh, and it this acts on v, so this is we would like to be able to realize this by an element of spinner norm one. If the spinner norm, if the uh, an element of norm one up here, if the norm is not one, so the idea is if I take this, we can't instantaneously write this uh, as u, let's say u prime. Uh, well, u inverse doesn't really matter. As u over the square root of u times x times u prime u inverse over the square root of u. So I can't necessarily realize this is an x; it's not a times. Okay. I can't necessarily realize this as an element of norm 1. Okay. And the reason I can't realize an element of norm 1 is because there are square classes. Okay. And this element might live in one of those square classes, might have norm in one of those square classes, and so I can't just trivialize it. So that's the obstruction here as to why I have a, a covering of the group but acts through a subgroup. So if you've never seen that before, uh, then I guess you can ignore it slightly. But if you have thought about it, it's a little bit confusing, so I just wanted to make a comment. Okay. So uh, you can use this to define the spinner genus. So I guess I probably won't have time to do explicit examples. So we can use theta to define uh, a spinner equivalence of lattices. Okay. Uh, and this is harder to see on quadratic forms. So the idea is that if I have a lattice, then I'd like to say that the lattice is equivalent to the other lattice if it's the usual equivalence of the genus is that if it's locally equivalent everywhere. Okay? What that means, uh, so usually, we say that L is equivalent over ZV to L prime if and only if there exists some sigma in the orthogonal group, or let's say the special orthogonal group, uh, so orthogonal or special orthogonal, I'm just going to change to special orthogonal here because that's what I'm using, this is properly equivalent, uh, if there exists so that L is equal, or sigma L is equal to L prime. So in uh, over over QV. Okay. So if there's a local isometry that takes one to the other, then we say that they're locally equivalent. Okay. Here, I'd like to, instead of using the orthogonal group for equivalence, I'd like to use the spinner norm group, for the, the kernel of the spinner norm group as to, for the equivalence. And so uh, for spinner equivalence, uh, what you'd like to do is you'd like to say that L is spinner equivalent to L prime. Now, you can define it locally by saying, well, there's, uh, there's always an element of spinner norm 1, which takes one lattice to the other. But globally, uh, if I look at an element of the orthogonal group globally, it may not uh, be in all of those spinner norm groups. Okay? This is proper equivalence, yes. Yeah. So I'm changing to proper equivalence now because that's where the spin group lives, the double cover of the special orthogonal group. Yes, so this, is, so this is proper equivalence. Okay. So uh, here, this is the same thing as saying that, well, okay. so here I'll say that they're spinner equivalent if, so this is spinner equivalent, so this is for all, so, for all places to be. So this is the, if you're in the genus uh, of L, uh, is the set of all lattices which are locally equivalent for all places to be. Okay. The spinner genus of L 
are things which are uh, locally equivalent by something of spinner norm one, but up to some global isometry. Okay, so let me say it this way. So if L is equal to, uh, if L prime is equal to some element, which I'll call sigma times lambda v times L prime, where so this is LV. Sigma is an element of the global orthogonal group, O plus of V. I'm sorry? Uh, thank you. Okay. If there's some fixed global element, uh, which transforms the vector space to itself, times some sigma V, which is in the spinner kernel for all v. So again, the reason for doing this, uh, you could have said the same statement for the usual genus, bless you, but uh, the, the difference is that here, this element of the global orthogonal group, of the rational orthogonal group, might not be in all the spinner kernels. Okay, so that's the reason. So this, this definition specializes to this one, but uh, it's hard to see this from this. Okay, so this actually gives a refinement of the notion of, of genus. So this gives a notion of the spinner genus uh, of some lattice L, okay, which is smaller, which is possibly smaller, than the genus of L. You can get to less lattices this way. So let me just uh, close with uh, two theorems. One is that you can understand the number of spinner genera uh, in the genus. So that there exist exactly uh, two to the to some power, so exactly two to some power, okay, two to the alpha uh, spinner genera. Uh, in the genus of L. Okay. And this, this alpha is, is explicitly computable. I'm not telling you what it is, but uh, this is explicit. So if you have a quadratic form, you can compute the number of spinner genera, and basically it's just a computation of these spinner norm groups locally uh, at finitely many places. Okay, and that's what gives this to you. And the extremely important theorem, the consequence of this for quadratic forms, uh, is that uh, you can actually, for an indefinite form, so if n is greater than or equal to 3, and indefinite, and this is a theorem by Eichler, okay, called strong approximation, then uh, we can have exactly one class in each spinner genus. So this means that the issue of how many classes are in the genus, okay, if you have an indefinite form and three or more variables, so the picture is you have a genus, and each of these, this breaks up into some number of spinner genera. This is the spinner genus of L, the spinner genus of L prime, the spinner genus of L double prime, etc. Okay. And each of these breaks up into some number of classes, but there's only one class in each of them. And so you can actually use local information uh, with these spinner norm groups to understand what's happening in the representation numbers of each of these classes. Okay. So uh, in the last lecture earlier this morning, I tried to explain how you can use uh, a formula of Siegel to understand, uh, use local information to understand global representation numbers. And I, I showed for the sum of four squares that you could exactly derive formulas for the number of representations uh, if the class number is one. Uh, and there are similar formulas, uh, or similar ideas, let me say it that way. There are formulas, but the number of representations is not finite. But if you, if you uh, mod out by the automorphism group, there are similar formulas for understanding the number of global representations by an indefinite form in terms of the number of local representations, even within a spinner genus. Okay? So uh, this idea is, is very useful. This means that we have a local global, so this means we have a local global uh, result uh, for indefinite forms in three or more variables. Okay. So in particular, you can characterize what numbers they represent 
uh, just by looking at what numbers are represented locally by the spinner genus. Okay? And that's, that's really cool. That means that if you want to know what numbers are represented by a quadratic form, uh, if it's indefinite, you can always answer that question with a finite amount of computation in three or more variables. Okay? And that's not true if you have a positive definite form. Uh, currently, there is no algorithmic way of resolving what numbers are represented by a positive definite form in three variables. Okay? So maybe I'll just stop there, and uh, thank you for staying.